Good morning. Welcome to River Lawn Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Chris Kilburn. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Today's a very special day. Today we celebrate Pentecost. We celebrate the outpouring and indwelling of the Holy Spirit upon the church, the birth of the church, and know that that wasn't just an event 2,000 years ago, that this is something we not only remember, but we're able to participate in as we pray and ask the Lord to fill us with his spirit to accomplish the work that he has for us. So we want to wish you a happy Pentecost. And speaking of Pentecost, we want to let you know that throughout the year, we take up some special offerings. And there is a special offering called the Pentecost offering. What's the Pentecost offering for? Well, this is an, a, a, an effort that is a, a church-wide unifying effort to support young people in Christ and helping to encourage them and to inspire them to share their faith, to know their gifts, to use those unique gifts for the church and in the world. And also it has a specific emphasis on at-risk youth and how we're able to do that. So if you're wanting to support this ministry, and again, for all the ways that you've supported through your giving, your tithes and offerings, the ways you have sent that in to the church, we appreciate your support uh, as we seek to live into the, the, the work the Lord has for us. One way you're able to do that with the Pentecost is just designate that gift uh, for the Pentecost offering. We mentioned Pentecost as the birth of the church, and speaking of birthdays, we want to wish uh, our own Ernie Powell a, a very happy 90th birthday. Forgive me <laughs> if I didn't ask you to so okay before, but we do want to, to celebrate you, Ernie, and say that we love you and pray the Lord's blessing upon you. And also, in the last but not least... Uh, if you haven't heard already, next Sunday, May 30th, is a big day, a day that so many of us have been longing for, waiting for. We're going to be heading back into the church, and we will have worship uh, in our sanctuary, first time in well over a year. So we look forward to that. We want to invite you to join us for that, to be a part of that. We do want you to be well aware of the, the health and safety guidelines that we're going to be observing. You should have received uh, an informational letter at the end of April, as well as a kind of a follow-up a few days ago, uh, emphasizing just some of the things that are going to be happening during the service, as far as junior church and nursery and how we're going to be worshiping together. So we want to make sure you have that opportunity to re review all of that. And if for some reason you can't find it uh, in an email or through our Facebook page or the website, uh, reach out to us. We'll be happy to make sure that you get that. But again, we want to invite you to join us next Sunday as we come to the house of the Lord and worship his name. So we've come to do that today. So as we do today, let's prepare by coming before the Lord and, and, and just welcoming uh, <laughs> Welcoming not only one another, but, but calling upon the Lord to, to fill us today as we worship him. So let's pray together. Mighty God, we dare to ask what it would be like if your Holy Spirit blew through our churches again as he did on the day of Pentecost. Lord, we want to speak the language that you have given louder and clearer in our lives and as your church. So come, Holy Spirit, pour out your fire upon us to faithfully be the body of Christ in a world that is hurting, hungry, and hopeless. We want to bring the good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to those held captive. We want to point people to Jesus. Holy One, ignite within us a fiery passion for your mission in the world. Make us wholly present to experience a new birth and awaken possibilities within us to share your love and life with all those we meet. Lord, this morning we come to celebrate your harvest, a harvest bearing the first fruits of the Spirit within us. So show us how to use these gifts as we listen for your truth and the leading of your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And sin, as we enter worship, as we prepare ourselves, as we ask the, the, the refiner to be refining us and purifying us, let us hear our, our prelude. May this be our prayer as well. Create in me a clean heart.
thank you, Pam, for uh, leading us into worship. As we turn to the Lord, as we again pray that prayer, let us come to him in confession. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, you poured out your spirit upon the gathered disciples, creating bold tongues, open ears, and a new community of faith. We confess that we too often hold back as the Spirit works among us. We do not listen for your word of grace, speak the good news of your love, or live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your Spirit and fill us with a flaming desire to be your faithful people, doing your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. Friends, hear this good news. The spirit of the living God has been poured out on all flesh. And we have been made one in him. We are no longer scattered or divided, but gathered together to build up God's kingdom on this earth. That in Christ Jesus, we are forgiven, and through his Holy Spirit, we are being transformed. This is the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. So let us sing as we celebrate, as we rejoice, as we're thankful. Let's sing unto God and sing together, sweet, sweet spirit. As we've sung that song, uh, it's interesting because you, we may not be able to see the faces uh, of those who we're worshiping with. But in faith, we've come together in unity in the power and presence of the Spirit who unifies us. And we celebrate that, what he's doing and has done and is about to do in our lives. And so let us witness this again as we come to God's word, as we come to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Let's hear the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Picking up in verse 22, Peter says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep hold of him. And then verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we come to your word, and again, we want to see Jesus. And so we pray for your spirit to fill us again, to move in our hearts, to open our eyes, to illumine our minds, to move us to respond by your grace and power. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. In a, a Bible study, some women were talking about the process of being refined by fire. How we see this in God's word, what it means for us as God's people to be refined. And they were unfamiliar with the process of refining, so they decided to go right to the source. They visited a silversmith to learn more. And he told them that the silver had to be placed in the hottest part of the fire, otherwise the impurities would remain. They would not be burned away. And he, he also had to, to watch the whole time to make sure that it was not in the fire too long or it would be ruined. And so one of the women asked, well, how do you know? How do you know when it has been refined? And he replied, when I can see my reflection. Beautiful picture, isn't it? Certainly a biblical one. The one who refines us so that we uh, imitate and reflect his image more and more. And we're going to talk about the work of God and his refining work this morning, particularly through the Holy Spirit on this day of Pentecost. And so today, my first Pentecost thoughts come from Exodus 19. I'm not sure if you've ever looked at Exodus 19 before in connection to Acts 2, but I think it's a very clear one. Uh, we, we looked at this a number of years ago, and it's fascinating. So here's the background. The Israelites, led by Moses, have escaped Egypt, right? They've crossed the sea by God's hand, right? And they arrive at Mount Sinai. Now, on this day, on this day, they would come, it would become to be known as something. The Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Harvest, the Day of First Fruits, and Pentecost. Did you know that? The Pentecost 
And it's not, it doesn't originate in Acts 2 in the New Testament. It originates at Mount Sinai, all the way back in Exodus 19. Pentecost, the word Pentecost itself means 50, right? It refers to the number 50. Why? Because 50 days after that first Passover, right? where those who were trusting in the deliverance of God had put the blood on, on their doorframe and posts and it, the, the angel of death passed over and they were spared, right? So they celebrated that every year. And 50 days after that first Passover, they come to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, what happens? They receive the law. It's pretty fascinating when you think about this. Fifty days after their Passover in Egypt, they come here. and God reveals himself in a way that he has never revealed himself before. He would give the law containing the directives that would guide the people to know him better. Here the Lord reveals himself to Moses. And as you will recall, the, the Lord has revealed himself to him before, right? Through the burning bush. And now we see the Lord made manifest again, and this time he's even more flamboyant. So let's look at Exodus 19, beginning in verse 16. And let's take in all the sights and sounds. On the morning of the third day, it says, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up like the smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. There's a lot of stuff in there we're going to cover. The whole mountain was covered with smoke like that of a furnace because the Lord had come in fire. Right? The mountain shook violently. The sound grew louder. And finally, the Lord's voice was heard. We'll get, we'll get to all that. We'll get to all that. Right here, we see the glorious presence of the Lord appearing on Mount Sinai in full force, revealing to his people his presence, his power, and his purity. So now let's skip ahead 1,500 years. Okay? God has just appeared again. But he did not just appear on earth in a cloud. He appeared as a man. Jesus, God in the flesh, came into this world, ministered among us, was crucified according to the Father's plans to make a way for us to be reconciled to the Father, to be with him forever. And then he rose from the dead to give us a living hope, and then he promised that he would never leave us alone. But then he ascended to heaven. It would seem that he did. But he promised, he promised another like him, the Holy Spirit would come to be with us and to live in us. And so here at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, it's been 10 days since Jesus had been lifted up in the ascension. And it's been 50 days since his resurrection. This is when the day of Pentecost came. Do you see the connection? It's amazing. 50 days after the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt, God came in power. Fifty days after Jesus had delivered us from the slavery of sin and death, God came in power. Once again, God is made manifest, almost with the same effects. And Jewish tradition had always associated storms, fire, voice with the presence of God. It's called theophany. Right? And so here in Acts 2, we read this. A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. Tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Storm, fire, voice. It was Pentecost all over again. The providence of Pentecost. 
The people of God saw God, the, the, the people of God saw the glory of God at Sinai, and the nation saw the glory of God on that city on a hill in Jerusalem. But the Pentecost of Acts 2 exceeds that of Exodus 19. Why? Why? Well, the fire on Mount Sinai was particularly for Moses. Everyone else stood at a distance. Only Moses got the fire of God in his life. Only Moses got God's power. Only Moses understood God's presence, that he was specifically anointed by the, by the Spirit of the Lord. But not anymore. Now since Acts 2, Pentecost, God's power, God's purity, and God's presence are for all believers. They're for all of us. He's for all of us. That the word says that transformative things happen in our lives. How? By the Spirit and with the Spirit. But more than this, the word says that the Spirit lives within us as well. We read in Ephesians chapter 2. In Christ, the whole building, describing the body of Christ, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. And in Him... You too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Throughout the New Testament, particularly in Paul's letters, you see this language that is both corporate and individual. That we are the body of Christ. We are the building of God, the family of God. And that there's this jointedness, this connectedness. And it is the Holy Spirit who makes us one. So there's that corporate level of it. The temple of God, the people of God. But also talks about... Be, us being the temple of the Holy Spirit, which he dwells. So there's the individual side as well. So as believers, the Spirit has taken up residence in us. The Spirit does not just show up occasionally as the need arises. No, the Spirit abides in us. Okay? And so this goes to show really that the Holy Spirit is not just for certain believers either. He's not just for those who have some monumental task to accomplish or that XYZ has happened in their life or they have certain spiritual gifts that only the Holy Spirit is for them. No, the Spirit brings power for each person to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And I can think of no greater task than for us average folk, right, to live faithfully with each day that we've been given. This is a task worthy to be accomplished, and it is desperately needed in our world today. Isn't it? Wouldn't you agree with that? For when the Spirit is powerfully present, that's true, our ordinary does become extraordinary, but only through the Spirit of the living God. And it's only for the kingdom of God. It's not for us. It's not for our ends or reasons or pursuits. It's for the kingdom of God. And as his power, his power, God's power, that mighty rushing wind is for each of us, so too is his fire for each of us. And that fire is the refining fire of God because it changes us. It cleanses us. It makes us like him, that we reflect that image, right? I see a reflection, right? In Malachi 3, verse 2 says this, Who will endure the day of the Lord's coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Then the Lord will have a people who will bring offerings in righteousness. That's when it's going to happen. When the Spirit comes to refine, he's done that through his Holy Spirit. John the Baptist describes Jesus' ministry with these words. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Lord is the one who changes lives. And yes, that, be, that begins with forgiveness, thanks be to God. But guess what? It doesn't end there. That is why he's given us his spirit to continue the transforming work in our lives, a work that cleanses and recreates and empowers. He's doing it now. But if the Holy Spirit has the power to change us, you may ask, well, why do we still struggle? Why are we still stubborn? Why do we still have spots? And plenty of them, right? Again, Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Spirit. This is an imperative. It is a charge to Christians. 
to be continually filled with the Spirit. But you may be thinking, well, Chris, I thought I received the Holy Spirit when I put my faith in Jesus. That it was the Spirit who entered and took that which was dead and made it alive. Yes, absolutely. That's what we call being baptized by the Holy Spirit. That happens once. But we are to, we're commanded to be continually filled with His Spirit. The idea of being filled is, is yielding, surrendering to His control in our lives. The Word teaches us that we cannot sit back, we just can't turn on autopilot and expect the Holy Spirit to do the rest. That's not what this is. No, we are not the hand puppets of the Holy Ghost. That's not how this works. That's not how the scriptures reveal the Holy Spirit. But nor is the, the spirit-filled life a one-time shot. Right? It, it, it makes little difference what kind of experience we once had with God if our life isn't showing it now. And if we're not, if we're not living with his power in our life to be faithful to Jesus, because that's the purpose of it, to be faithful to Christ, and if we aren't living with victory over sin, then we need to once again be filled with the Holy Spirit and to pray for that because only He can refine us, transform us. And this is the thing. As we talk about our spots, as we talk about the one who refines us, our impurities can threaten us, can be threatening more than we realize. More than we realize. Because our sin can not only damage us, it can divide the church. It can divide us. And that is why the Spirit is not only our refining agent, He is our unifying agent. Paul proclaims it to the church in Ephesians 4, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another and love. These are the fruit of the Spirit. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It's not the unity of you or the unity of me. It's the unity of the Holy Spirit through the bond of peace. This because why? There is one body and one Spirit. So it is the Spirit who makes us one. During World War II, Hitler commanded all religious groups to unite so that he could control them. And those who went along with the order had a much easier time. Those who did not faced harsh persecution, sometimes death. And so when the war was over, feelings of bitterness ran deep between these groups. You can imagine others saying, well, you, 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 you forfeited it. You know, you, you've denied, you failed. But finally, in the midst of the animosity and the division, they decided the situation had to be healed. There needed to be healing. There needed to be reconciliation. If they were to be the church. If they were to fulfill their mission in the kingdom of God. So for several days, leaders of each of these groups, they spent days, time in prayer, examining their own hearts in light of Christ's command. So they came in a spirit of humility and repentance. We've been talking about that, right? Not only uh, these recent months, but even uh, last year as well. We were being called to times of repentance and humility and faith, and prayer and fasting. And so they were examining their hearts in the light of Christ's commands, and then they came together. Francis Schaeffer, the, the renowned author and theologian, had a friend who had been there, and, and Schaeffer asked, what? Well, what did you do then? And the person replied, we were just one. That shouldn't seem anticlimactic. <laughs> that should be the end. It should be something that is precious and something to rejoice over. That as they confessed to God their hostility, and as they yielded to his control, the Holy Spirit created unity among them. The anger of men was replaced by the love of Christ thanks to the Spirit of God. That is the power that is availed to us. That we are to seek the Lord to be filled, to be forgiven, to be unified, to be refined. 
Because when unity prevails among Christians, especially in times of disagreement, it presents to the world an indisputable work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. That's what Jesus did. Right before he was arrested, before he was crucified, the high priestly prayer, he prayed for his disciples. He prayed for believers, prayed for the world. And he said, Lord, make, make these disciples, make these that you have given me one, so that, that the world may believe and give glory to you. This desire to be unified, and it happens through the Holy Spirit. And we've seen it time and time again in Scripture and in our own lives. God's Spirit is about fire, but not about friction. That we're called to be unified. And the book of Acts records incident after incident of men and women numbering into the thousands, receiving the promise and the person of the Holy Spirit. And these accounts have only swollen beyond measure throughout the centuries and around the world that Peter's words in Acts 2.39 have come true. That this promise is for you and for your children and for those who are far off. It is still for those who are still far off. All those to whom we are sent. All those to whom the Lord our God will call, as Peter says. And it may very well be by the Spirit of God working and speaking through you. Through me. Through His church. I mean, let that sink in. And pray for it. Make that your prayer. That as we continue to intercede for others. In the midst of uncertainty. Sickness. Pain. Conflict. Division. May we also be interceding for those who are living in darkness. May we boldly approach God's throne of grace. Praying that he will send his Holy Spirit. To bring life where there is death. And hope where there is despair. Are you praying for that? Will you pray for that with me? So on Pentecost, we remember the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Coming down into the world. Coming down into our lives. But Pentecost is not something we simply remember. And it's not something we simply celebrate. This is it, folks. This is what I've been trying to communicate. Pentecost is acting on God's promise by the powerful presence of God living in us. I'm going to say that again because it's so important. Pentecost is our acting. It's acting on God's promise by the powerful presence of God living in us. It's that beautiful paradox of it only being the Spirit's work, but Him choosing to work in and through us, despite our faults and failures, right? Right? That's the beauty of it. Now, many of us are content to remain unchanged while the personal fire of God waits to refine us. And so I invite you today, come to the mountain of God. Come to him. Come before the Lord and ask him once again to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Pray for that every day. And may we yield. May we yield to the Spirit of God. And may he continue to to transform us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We give you praise this morning. Lord, we thank you that you have entered in, that you have come by your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we pray again. We pray, Holy Spirit, fill us. May we surrender and yield to you. Lord, we desire to become more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. So refine us. Even though that process may be hard or difficult or painful, refine us and work in us. Open our eyes and our minds and our hearts and our hands. May we turn from the trappings of this world, any worldly understanding, and may we come before you humbly in confession. Seeking what only you can give. That forgiveness and direction and revival. 
Lord, by your grace and power, may we honor you and serve your people and minister to the lost and broken and to do so joyfully and faithfully. Come, Holy Spirit. To God be the glory. We praise you, Lord of life. Amen and amen. As we continue to worship, we have an opportunity to respond to the grace and power and provision and presence of the Lord as we give back unto the Lord for his purposes and his kingdom, that he uses those gifts, that he uses our lives, that he uses the spiritual gifts that the Spirit has given us for that end. And so we come to bring our tithes and offerings, to set those apart for his purposes uh, today, and may we set apart ourselves as well as we give unto the Lord. Would you pray with me? God of amazing grace and abundant gifts, we thank you and praise you for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, enlighten our thinking, strengthen our will, give us courage, and lead us in gratitude, service, and sacrifice, that we may live faithfully and fully where we are. Use these gifts and our lives to that end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Now we'll hear our choir sing for us, Healer of my heart. Thank God that he's our healer. Thank God for his spirit. Let us worship.
we come before the Lord, we come to a time where we can pray for one another in the midst of our struggles and our hardships and our uncertainties, our pain, our grief. Uh, we do want to let uh, you know, you may have heard this through the prayer band, um, saddens me to have to share, that former pastor of Riverlawn, Lang Montgomery, um, went to be with the Lord, so we rejoice for him. Uh, it was this past Wednesday, he, he died in his sleep. So we want to be praying for his family, and we want to hold on to that assurance. We want to, to know that because of his faith and also his life, to be able to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, to go to that place that's been prepared for him and is being prepared for us. May we hold on to that hope, that living hope we have in Jesus Christ, that because he lives, we also will live. We're thankful that that's true for, for Lang. We also want to be praying uh, for those who grieve uh, his loss until we are reunited. So let's lift him up. You have other burdens and, 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 and struggles and prayers, I imagine. And so we want to pray for you as well. And to pray for this world where there is unrest, where there is fear and hatred and violence and injustice. Uh, you've probably encountered that too. Sometimes closer to home than we, we feel comfortable with. And so we pray. We pray for the Spirit's reconciling, redeeming work um, in our lives, in our community, and around this world. So would you pray with me? Loving God, we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit to help us as we pray and that we might pray as we ought. We ask for the strength and vision of your spirit for those who are tiring in the battle against injustice and evil. We ask for the hope and comfort of your spirit to those whose lives are overshadowed by illness or pain, for those whose lives are, are darkened by sorrow or grief. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask for the peace and refuge of your spirit, for those living in the shadow of violence, for those eaten up by guilt or fear, for those whose Christian life has become hard and dry. We ask for the wisdom and guidance of your spirit when we are uncertain on how to use our time, talent, and gifts, when we are tempted to do wrong, when we would prefer to serve ourselves. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask for the love and the courage of your spirit as we reach out to comfort the distressed, as we reach out with the good news of Christ Jesus. Loving God, we ask for the assurance of your spirit to know your presence with us in our daily lives, in our relationships, in our work, in our worship, in our times of joy and pain in the midst of those who grieve for our, for our brother Lang, for others who are grieving the loss of loved ones, for those carrying burdens that we are not aware of, but you are more than aware of, that your spirit would come in. And so, Holy Spirit, help us. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. Pam has prepared our postlude this morning. This is another prayer that we can offer, especially as the Spirit of God indwells within us and we pray to be filled. Open my eyes that I may see. Open our eyes and our hearts and that we may also respond as well. And we close with this blessing and this charge. Go out into all of the world and labor to bring forth new life. You can do that through the Spirit of God. Speak of God's goodness in the words of those who would hear. Again, the Spirit enabled those first disciples. He can enable and will enable us.
And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight. May Christ Jesus give hope to your living each day. And may the Holy Spirit, your refiner and counselor, set your hearts ablaze and make you one that the world would know of our great God and Redeemer and believe and believe and give him glory. So go in peace to love and serve your Lord. Thank you for worshiping with us. May the Lord bless and keep you.